place in the Bible. We have been doing a study uh, from verses 12 through 15 as we're work, work, working our way, way through the book. We've been dealing with uh, trials, trials and temptations, as the song said. And today we're talking about being tested or tempted is the perazmas idea of the Greek word. And so I use the word testing all the way through. In verse 12, we studied testing by God. In verse 13, we've studied testing by Satan. In 14, 15, we're going to talk about testing of lust of the sin nature. And what's interesting about this passage, it's one of the few places in the Bible without studying a lot of history about a person's life, you can actually see how sin is manifested, personal sin is manifested in a person's life from start to finish. This kind of makes it very interesting. To be able to do that in a couple verses is just pretty amazing. And so James writes about this. He says in verse 14, but one, but each one, everyone is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust, then when lust has conceived, see how he's going along with this? It gives birth to sin, and when sin has been born or given birth or accomplished, it brings forth death. And that, that's the whole process. If you looked at how the process works, it in a believer's life, how lust of the sin nature takes it all the way to death. So that's kind of interesting how he laid that out in two verses. Uh, we're going to look at six aspects. It'll probably take us a couple, probably won't be able to get that done in this one. But we're going to take a shot at it. We're going to look at six things in this study because I want you to be able to see this because this is where the average church-going person fails in his Christian life. The average person that goes to church every Sunday and is a serious person about the Word of God and about his own growth, this is where failure, this is, this, and this is not the angelic conflict. This, is not the, this has nothing to do with that. But in, a, in a way, it has something to do with it, but this, this is an internal warfare that goes on between you and the lust of your flesh. It's not outside interference, like in the angelic conflict. This is something that goes on with your life and something that you have to beat under the principles of God's grace. You don't have to beat it alone. And that wonderful that we don't have to go through this life alone, face all the trials and tribulations of our life alone. I mean... We have God the Father, we have God the Son, and we got to have God the Holy Spirit that's always there cheering us on and working with us through our process. But here we have a principle that's really important to every church age believer because James tracks personal sin from its start to its end. And um, there's no passage like that can do that. Others talk about it, like Romans, the sixth chapter, seventh chapter, eighth chapter. They talk a lot about it, but this guy covered it in two verses. <laughs> I mean, boom, boom, he got, there it is. And it's a, it's a wonderful passage on it. So let's start with number one, and that is what you need to understand is the origin, the historical origin of sin, the historical origin of sin. Where, did, where does sin come from? I mean, what is its origin? What's its historical origin? How did it get into the human uh, phenomena of life? How, how did that happen? So I think that's very important that you understand that because James has taken it for granted that you know that. So he jumps right in here into the Christian life and says you have a sin nature and you have lust of the sin nature and here's how that works. But I need to, I need to be sure that you know where the origin of that is. The historical origin. I mean, how is it that I, I how is that all got, got in my life? Is it my fault? I mean, so I think it's important 
that I give you the historical background. And the easiest way to do that is for you to understand the three categories of sin. And this is really important that you get this this morning. The three categories of sin. And I, t- I put them all in eyes. Hopefully you could remember them. Anybody with three eyes, right, makes us unique. So there's imputed sin. Notice that on your paper. There's inherent sin. And there's individual sin that we call personal sin. There's my three eyes. And it's really important. The historical background, because James is talking about the lust of the sin nature, the lust of the sin nature, uh, and the and the Christian cooperating together in the gratification of it that become the gratification of the lust of the sin nature becomes personal sin when it's conceived. And actually, what this is about is pregnancy. The the analogy that James has used through this whole thing is pregnancy and birth, which is kind of interesting in itself. Uh, so here's the here's where the whole thing began. Here's where the origin, historical origin begins, and I'm going to show you Genesis three six uh, three uh, sixteen the, at the judgment of the violation of two seventeen. Here's what, here's what the Lord said to Adam. This is under judgment. Here's what he says as he says as a judge. Here's what he said. He said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, you shall not eat from the tree. Okay? He, gives, he lays down a law. He lays down the divine judgment that's going to come with it and the consequences. In 2.17, he says, if you eat from the tree, dying, you will die. In Hebrew, dying, you will die. And so, and he ate from the tree and he didn't die physically for 500 some years. So what what was the death that he suffered when he ate from the tree? Spiritual. He lost he lost fellowship. He lost relationship with God, and it had to be restored. Then the end of that deal, of that 500 years, he's going to die a physical death. So out of, and, and of course, that's been passed on. That whole system has been passed on to us. Imputed death, imputed sin is that very factor that's been imputed to us. People have a hard time understanding because it's not volitional. Imputed sin is not volitional. That's why it's called imputed sin. It, to give you an example, it would be like this. The Israelites were in bondage for 400 years in Egypt. We all understand that. It wasn't, it wasn't volitional. They were born, for 400 years, people were born into slavery. Born into it. That analogy is used for us in imputed sin. We are born in to the slave market of sin. It's not a choice you make. It's a choice that's been made for you. And that's called imputed sin. And everybody, like, turning your Bibles to Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12. Here's imputed sin. Wherefore, just as by one man, Adam. Now watch the just so and just as and so. That there's two parts of this verse. Just as so. See that in your Bible? Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world and death by sin and so... Death spread to all men, for all have sinned. That's imputed sin. See the key word, passed on. It's been passed on. And Adam, the first Adam, becomes the federal head of that system. And Jesus Christ, the last Adam, in 1 Corinthians 15, 45, 
becomes the federal head of a new system of the new birth. Here's the first birth under Adam. Here's the new birth under Christ. And the only way out of the dilemma of Adam is the last Adam, Jesus Christ. I didn't add a word of prayer, have I? All right. Let's pray. I give you a moment of silence as a believer priest. The privilege as a priest in this dispensation of the church to confess your sins to the Lord under 1 John 1, 9, and he is faithful and just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. I'm going to tell you, you'll never find a better deal in this world anywhere except in Christ. It doesn't matter what sin it is. It just matters that it is. It could be mental attitude sins. It could be sins of the tongue. It could be overt sins. When you confess him, he forgives, cleanses. He's faithful and just. And what he's trying to do is get you to come back and be faithful and just with him. A confession of sin, I'm coming back to you faithful and just. I want to be faithful and just. I want to be like your character. If any man confesses sin, he's faithful and just to forgive him and to cleanse him. He wants us to be those kind of people. Wants us to be those people who forgive others as we've been forgiven. That's 1 John 1, 9. Are you that kind of a person today? So do that, and then we'll begin our study. Our Father, we're so thankful today for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the Internet, and we pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the Word of God in our souls. Under the ministry of the Holy Spirit, Father, the Holy Spirit is so essential in learning and in the application of the Word of God into our human life experiences under maximum pressure. We will need that ministry of the Holy Spirit. We are weak and he is strong. Yes, Father, and we're thankful for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, here we are at point number one. Imputed sin. That's imputed sin. It's not a matter of choice. It's being born into the slave market of sin like Israelites for 400 years. Now, it was a choice to go out. It was a choice to leave bondage and go to freedom. And it was a choice once freed to stay freed from bondage. But bondage wasn't a choice. They were born into the slave market of Egypt as we were born to the slave market of sin. That's imputed sin in our life. And a Proof text for that is Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 12 through 21. That's proof text. Wherefore is just, therefore, just as and so you put those two together and you've got a wonderful grace program from God to correct something. So that's important that we understand that in our in our our pamphlet. Uh, so great a salvation, which we call the 50 things you will know that there are 13 judicial charges of Adam's original sin or imputed sin. 13 judicial charges. You should be very familiar with that. Now, I just mentioned one, and that was death by sin. They imputed death, sin, issue. But there are 13 charges from Adam's sin, and only thing that can correct it or remove that from your life is the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes to the cross. He dies for our sin. He's buried and raised from the dead to give his eternal life. When we believe it, we're saved. We're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It is a gift, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's really important because that's the only way out of the slave market of sin. It's the only way out. And it's a choice you make. Jesus Christ is the only way out. Moses was the only way out. Christ is the only way out. 
When you believe that, you are out. Now it's a matter of making the right choices under the grace plan that God has for your life to walk in the power of the spirit and to walk by faith, not to walk in the flesh and not to walk by sight. But that's after you've been saved. Only way out of the slave market is to get saved. And that's really important that you understand that. <clears throat> in Romans, a ninth chapter, in the Romans, the fifth chapter, verse 19, Paul wrote, <clears throat> For as through the one man disobedience, the many were, watch this, made sinners. You're made a sinner. Why? Because you choose? No, because you're born under imputed sin. You're made a sinner. Everybody that has a first birth is made a sinner, is spiritually dead, is alienated from God, is blind, is cursed, condemned in darkness, in spiritual death, at enmity with God, is perishing, is a natural man, is ungodly, uh, a sinner, unrighteous, and under the wrath of God. Those 13 judicial charges are on you because you were born in the slave market of sin. And the only way out of that is Jesus Christ. He went to the cross to remove you from the slave market of sin to put you in the kingdom of God. And it's all by grace. It's not by works. Listen, they worked, the Israelites worked harder than in probably any person in human history and never could get out by their good works. The only way out of the bondage of, of the slave market of sin is grace through the Lord Jesus Christ. It, that's, the, that's the message that the world, we need to take to the world. That's the message that the world is dying to hear. <laughs> or I say, they're dying anyhow. That's the message. You know, you meet people every day just struggling in their life. They're struggling in their marriage. They're struggling. They're struggling. And the answers to their problems are so simple. That they blow you off because their problems are so complicated because they got them all screwed up so bad. They got all these wires mixed up and can't separate them. Don't know which one to cut and which one to plug and all that business. And the answer is very simple. Get your hand. Leave the wires alone. Let somebody with higher intelligence fix it. That's what it means to be saved. That's what it means to be a spiritual person. This is why it's important for you to sit and study the word of God and then apply it to your life. I'll tell you why that's important, because you need to see the power of it working in your life to share it with somebody else. Because you're not motivated until you do that, until you see the word of God and the Holy Spirit work and change your life in some of the most miraculous ways. You got nothing to share. Well, when you see that work in your life and the life of people around you that are close, that confide in you, and you give them the straight answers, and they apply it, and they see God do great and marvelous things in their life, now you got something going. That's, that's what I'm saying. Through the one man disobedience of many were made sinners, that's first birth. Even so, through the obedience of the one Christ, the last Adam, many will be made righteous. That's imputed righteousness. Jesus Christ takes imputed sin and replaces it with imputed righteousness. It's not a righteousness you earn. And it's not a righteousness you could earn to keep. It is a grace gift from God. Part of the 50 things you receive at salvation, you can never lose in time and eternity. <laughs> how, how many of those are you thankful for? You say, well, I'm thankful for my salvation. I, and when people say that to me, I say, well, which, which, tell me, tell me one thing you're thankful about it. 
they usually give me the one something all over before they had before they got saved that they got saved over. I want to know something you got on the other side. What did you get? Then we have a now we have a chance for a dialogue. Now we have a chance to really see what's going on. Most people walk walk around their whole life and listen. It's good to be thankful you're saved, but what are you thankful about God every day about being saved? That's why we exist as a doctrinal church. You know, people always push back on me because we call ourselves a doctrinal church, right? But that's the truth of what the church is supposed to be. Categorical Bible doctrine. There is no better name for a church like ours than doctrinal studies. Because that's absolutely what we do, and that's about it. If you, if when we assemble, I teach do, categorical doctrine like I'm doing today. Now, here's the second one. The second one is inherent sin. This, too, does not involve volition of the individual. <clears throat> this is part of that slave market. This is part of the slave market. This is part of the slave market. Imputed sin and inherent sin, we call that the sin nature. We call it the old sin nature to remind you where it came from. In the Bible, and listen, theologian will call it sin nature, and that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. We refer to the old sin nature to always remind you where it came from. And that you shouldn't keep it active. <laughs> The message that James is talking about is shut it down. Imputed sin has been removed and taken care of, and that's a done deal. But inherent sin, it's part of the human flesh, and you have it till death. The old sin nature is also called flesh in some categories of theology. It's called flesh because it's connected with birth to death. Before you're saved, there's no way to control it. It runs on its own. After you're saved, God gives you the Holy Spirit that can control it. It's the only power that can control the old sin nature is the Holy Spirit. Let me show it to you. Go to Galatians. It's the only power. The unbeliever don't have power. He's got a sin nature, but it has no power over it. In fact, the old sin nature has power over him and has made him a master-slave relationship. I'll show it to you in a moment. Galatians. If we walk in the spirit, we will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Do you see that? If we walk in the spirit, that's peripateo. It don't matter what the circumstance of life is. I don't care if you're the, with the biggest hunk. He's got the best kisses you could ever have. Right? Apparently, I'm speaking to somebody that's in their 20s and under. Walk in the Spirit. Now, you have the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. He indwells you at a point of salvation, Galatians 3, 2. He indwells you. And in that indwelling power of the Holy, that's a second, that's a third member of the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. You have God the, God, God the Holy Spirit inside you. He's all powerful. And he's the only power that can control. Walk in the Spirit, you will what? Not fulfill the desire, the lust, the desire, the lust of the sin nature, which James is talking about today. In James 1, 14, 15. What is the only power over it? Listen, everybody's got one. Had it before you got saved. Has it after you got saved. Has it all the way to death. You understand that? So it's called flesh. The only power to control that sin nature in you, the, your nature to sin, whether it's in your mental attitude, anger, bitterness, malice, whatever, or sins of the tongue, 
I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. Isn't that an interesting statement? Boy, it was never anything more true than that. How about giving him a piece of Christ? Wouldn't that be good? How could you do that? Only way is in the Holy Spirit because you want to give him a piece of your mind when you ought to give him a piece of Christ. But that's the difference. You're going to give him a piece of your mind because that's flesh speaking to flesh. But the Christian life is the Holy Spirit speaking to the flesh. The first person he's got to speak to is you so that you can get the flesh out of the way. Get the flesh out of the way. Oh, I guess that was someone. That's the way you ought to think. That's the way you ought to think. Walk in the Spirit because he says in the next verse, because these two are in opposition to one another, so that who, which one you're following, that's the one that you're a slave to. These two are at war inside the believer's life. They are, they are all both struggling for control and dominance. Who's going to be the master of this ship? Who's going to drive this, keep this ship on course? That's really important that you understand this because now we're talking about, but the sea is an unbeliever. There is no power over the flesh. And so here's what people do. They use willpower to think that corrects it. And that's how deceptive the devil is. And so we have all kinds of, we, we go through counseling, we go through 12 steps, we go through, all of that's reform. It has nothing to do with regeneration and it has nothing to do with transformation. It doesn't regenerate you and it doesn't over here in the Christian life, it doesn't transform you. Let me show you it over here for a minute. L trying to lose weight. What do you mean trying? Trying to lose weight. I'm just taking under normal condition, not, not medical conditions, that we have a problem with overeating. Now, I'm not talking medical now. I understand there's medical issues. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about eating. So we get in all these kind of programs. To control the lust of the flesh because overeating is gluttony and gluttony is the lust of the flesh. Anybody going to go home at halftime? But I got I stepped on you. Oh, we could talk about the drunk, but I'm talking about the eater. All right, so that's what we do. What should you do? See, that's walking in the flesh. That's walking in the flesh. What should you do? I'll tell you what you should do. You should look to the Holy Spirit to give you power over that. You ought to go to a prayer life. You ought to tell God what, what is your real need of why you're eating so much. What is it in your life that you have found an escape goat for? Now for sure you're going home at half that. You're going to blame me on the weather. But see, I'm telling you how this thing works in the practical part. I just took one idea. So we go into some kind of a program, push our willpower, 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 willpower. Yeah, right. Until you get in another one of those stupor deals in your life where it says, life sucks, I'm going back to eat. When you ought to do is you ought to win by the Holy Spirit. Stop walking in the flesh. Start walking in the Holy Spirit. Take your issues to God. Pray over them and let the Holy Spirit say, you know why you're eating? You're depressed. You think you're in a place in your life that that you can't control, that you can't manipulate out, that you can't get a hold of, and you're stuck in that place, and you're going to be there forever. 
And that's not true. That's a lie from the devil. That is not true. Listen, you can live a victorious life. Listen, the power to overcome, be an overcomer, go by the grace operating assets of your life, the power of the Holy Spirit, walk by faith, pray and, and seek God, do great and mighty things in your life. Face, face the things in your life that are causing you to get out of fellowship with God. Figure those out and bring them before God. Food is not solving your, your, your problems. You're eating, they're not solving anything. It's not fixing your marriage. It's not fixing your health. It's not fixing anything. It's creating more problems. And the simple solution, walk in the power of the Spirit. Walk by faith, not by sight. Walk by the Spirit and not by the flesh. And I, te- I just touched about a hundred problems that Christians are having today, and they've gone to nuts over trying to solve them when this solution would be very simple. <laughs> Inherent sin. Inherent sin. 1 Corinthians, the third chapter, verses 1 through 3, talks about carnality versus spirituality. Carnality is walking in the flesh, and carnality is what you're looking at as a result of it. I've got this problem, i got that problem, i got this problem, i got that problem. They're called carnal problems. Where you should be walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. God gave you the third member of the Godhead so you could live victorious over your flesh. You drink for the wrong reasons. You eat for the strong, wrong reasons. You do all these things for the wrong reason, and you know it. And the fix is easy. The fix is easy. And you can't solve all the problems you created until you create the problem solver. You've got to have a problem solver to create the problems out there in your life. Well, if I could stop doing this, I would stop doing that, 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 that. No, well, you got to fix this first. Then individual sin. Oh, here, here's one. I want you to go to, are you still in Romans? No, I, I don't get it. I want you to go to Romans, the sixth chapter with me. Go to Romans, the sixth chapter. I want to show you this inherent sin before I leave it. 614. Watch this. This is important. For sin, said nature, for sin shall not be master over you. He's talking to Christians. Why? Because you're not under law, you're under grace. This is supernatural power. You have supernatural power access in your life, and you never tap into it. That's amazing to me. You have this John 7, 37 through 39 in your life. You have the Holy Spirit like this artesian well so that there, you'll never have a thirst in your life that he cannot satisfy. You will never have a thirst. You'll never have a desire that he cannot satisfy in a, in a divine principle way. Listen to what he says. For sin, sin nature, shall not be master over you, for you're not under the law, you're under grace. Yeah? Listen, when you got saved, he broke, he broke the the bondage, he broke the bondage that you were in to your sin nature, who was a master over you, and there was nothing you could do about it. Now, some people, they don't go depravity. They go good works and religion. Other people go depravity. They're both wrong. They're both in escape. Nobody's getting solved. The the, the issue is not solved. But when when that's broke from you, the Holy Spirit comes into your life, and now you have a power system over you. This is the Christian life I'm talking about. 
This should be so commonplace in your life. You go like, I know that. And listen, when you see the power of the Holy Spirit conquer and becomes a master of your life and you're a slave to Christ, you're going to, listen, you could write books that the world would want to read. That's where books come from. That's where Christian literature comes from. None of this goofy stuff over here, 12 steps to nowhere. These self-helps books. Listen, you got the best one in the whole wide world, the Bible, and you don't read it. You'd rather pick up, you'd rather pay $10 for a stupid book or read the Bible. What kind of problem you got in your life that Christ can't solve? Why are you throwing him under the bus and going to the world for a solution that takes a spiritual solution? Why the world ain't got a spiritual solution? Why do you do that? Individual sin, individual personal sin is a choice. That's for the believer, not the unbeliever. Personal sin is not an issue in an unbeliever's life. The best decisions he can make are called moral. The worst is religion. Because it tries to substitute Christ. Rather behavior. And I can't tell you how many people get individual sin confused with imputed sin. People think that they're. They're a sinner because they sin. No, you sin because you're a sinner. And there's nothing you can do about it. Except get saved. (laughs) Get saved. Once you're saved, you have a choice. You can walk in the flesh and then you're always confessing sin. You can walk in the spirit and find victory over the flesh. I know Christians that think they can't live above sin. I know Christians that have gone to church all their life and studied the Bible that don't believe they can win over sin. You know where sin comes from? Because, listen, it comes out of, in the Christian life, it comes out of choices you make of gratification of the lust of your flesh, the gratification of the sin nature. You can, listen, Jesus said that's controllable, easy. Walk in the Spirit and you'll not fulfill the, the lust of the flesh. You know what? I heard that for the first time. I went, whoa, wouldn't that be good if that was true? Woo, that would be really good. So I wrote it down and studied the Bible. And every time I got that, I, put, I, put, I, put, I had flashcards. I was a flashcard student in college. Now it's a flash phone. But it, there were flashcards when I was a kid. All the way through my education, I did flashcards. And so when I got saved, I heard, well, listen, you, I heard this message I'm giving you. I wrote them down on a piece of on a card, a three by five. I spent all my money on three three by fives, not apps. And so, listen, I I, I carried I carried them right here. And when I, when I would go like, I would get mad, I would get angry, I would get this, I would get that. I reach in there, and pull it out, and say, "You don't have to do this, buddy." You don't, that, that's how I wrote to myself. You don't have to do this, buddy. You can walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. And then I would fight with myself. No, I want to have a piece of pound of flesh. No, I, I want to have my say. I am tired of this. I don't care. They're like, well, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Now, I'm a slow learner, so all of you are faster than I am. But I carried those cards around. Until I finally went, look, I am not going there. I'm going to trust the Holy Spirit of God. And then I, I would go through it and didn't think about it. And then about an hour later, I, th- I would think, I forgot to think. Look, huh, I didn't get mad. I held my cool. I went through it. Huh, huh. Now, how'd that work, Ron? <laughs> Let me see. Okay. An hour later, I thank the Lord. Lord, thank you. I just had a big victory. I carried those flashcards around for years. 
until I, I finally came to realize I got a whole lot of flesh in me. I still have to work on it, but now those I don't carry flashcards there. I carry them here in my head. I set my mind on things above, and so when they come now, my flashcards are in my head. I go like, Ch-ch-ch. Ch-ch-ch. don't go there, you dummy. Don't go there. Go to the Holy Spirit. Don't go to the flesh. Uh, that pound of flesh is going gonna, is gonna to turn into a whole cow. Holy cow. You're going to dig so many bad experiences. Don't do it. Don't go there. See? You know what that's called? Overcoming. There's a word for that. Did you know that? Nike. Victor. A victor. It, you're an, that's how you become an overcomer. And that is such a good feeling to know you can be an overcomer. And then people, they come to you with a problem and you go like, I can tell you. But it's going to be so simple. Here, get, get a little flashcard. They say, I don't need it. I just do it right here. Uh, okay. They type it all in their little phone. That's okay. That's their flashcard. It's all right. Here we are in James. Here we are in James. Here we are in James, believe it or not. It's time for me to take a break. Here we're, I'm busting through this one, ain't I? Uh, I am moving down the pike. Here I am in James. Look what James says. Let's go back to James for a minute. That's, uh, let's see, Peter, James. Listen to what James says. Each one is tempted. When he's carried away and enticed, <laughs> carried away and enticed. You know where you got to catch this sucker? Carried away. Woo! Right there. Because you ain't sinned yet. Carried away is not a sin. Temptation is not a sin. That's normal function of the, of the lust of the flesh. You're not there yet. Temptation. Carried away. <laughs> you know when you're getting carried away. Come on now. Ah, oh, yeah. If you pay any attention to what I'm teaching you today, one of the things, the Holy Spirit will go like, you're getting carried away. In fact, somebody else standing by may say, hey, you're, little, you're getting a little carried away. <laughs> Come on now. Getting carried away, you got to put that up here in your head. Don't get carried away. Don't get carried away. Don't get carried away. Don't get enticed. That's, that's what I want to do. Carried away is, oh, oh boy, I can feel it coming. Uh, better, you better back off. <laughs> enticed? Now I'm thinking about how I'm going to do this. Listen to me. Romans 13, 14. Oh, that's a good verse. Now, I know you're not writing it down, but it's a good verse. It says, make no provisions for the flesh in regards to his lust. <laughs> Did you hear that? Carried away. Okay. Yeah, I'm really getting mad. <laughs> they were, uh, carried away. Enticed. Here's how I'm going to do this. I won't punch him right in the nose. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk out. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I will leave this. Enticed. Make no, enticed is make no provision for the flesh in regards to his lust. I went negative on you. I could go positive and you go, oh. You understand what I'm telling you? I want you to become an overcomer. I want you to find victory in your life for what it means to be saved and be an overcomer in the problems of your life because this is what the world wants to hear from you as a Christian. How'd you, how did you win? Listen, the world's full of losers. <laughs> well, let me tell you how I lost, buddy. They go like, shut up. I know about losing. I want to learn about winning. And this is what the Christian life, this message today is to teach you how to be an overcomer so that you can be a winner and not a loser. You know, the worst person that tells you a loser is you. 
When you tell yourself a loser, you are on the bottom of rung. Listen, everybody will tell you, don't buy into that. Do not ever tell yourself you're a loser. You are in Christ. You have all the grace operating assets to make you a victor. The only body holding you back is you, and you can step forward. Let's have a word of prayer. Every head bowed, every head closed. I'm giving you an opportunity. It's not, you, it's not that you've never heard this before, but maybe it's the first time you've heard it this way. <clears throat> you say, Rod, I know I'm a believer. I believe that Jesus died for my sins, was buried and raised from the dead. But I know I've got so many issues that overcome me and I don't overcome them. And today I understand that I can flip that. Instead of having them overcome me, I can overcome them. By the way I look at them, by the way I address them, by a way I allow them to dominate my life and my thinking. I can do that simply by walking in the power of the Holy Spirit and looking to the promises of God. If you're that person today, I want you to pause for just a moment and pray a prayer for yourself. I want you to pray a prayer for yourself. You, you can, I want you to become an overcomer from this day forward. I want you to become an overcomer. I want you to live the victory life rather than defeated. Listen, God has a marvelous plan for life. You're not behind anything in your life that you can't get ahead of. Father, I thank you today for these people who have come our way to hear this message. And when we come back the second hour, we're going to go deeper into this subject matter and deal with it. I pray, Father, as these prayers have gone up today, that they will find through the next couple of weeks real solutions to their problems and find peace and victory in their souls with a confidence about where they're going and who is guiding them and how their life is going to turn out. It turns out by daily decisions that we make spiritually or carnal. And I pray we would begin to make spiritual decisions, spiritual decisions for our life beginning today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're looking at point number three on your paper. The bondage, that's the master-slave relationship that we have at birth. We're born, like I said, in the first hour. Uh, the bondage master-slave relationship to the old sin nature was broken by grace, by the gospel of grace salvation. That thing is broken. That hold over you has been broken. You're no longer, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you no longer belong to that, that uh, kingdom of darkness or that world of darkness. You now belong to the kingdom of Christ. And in that transfer, that, that master-slave relationship of dominance, he ruled over you, has been broken. He's no longer the master. You're now under a new master, the Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew 6, 24, Jesus warned us that you can't serve two masters in Matthew 6, 24. And you need to understand that. You need to understand you're under a new master a relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So the bondage, the bondage of master slave uh, to the old sin nature is broken at the point of grace salvation. Romans 6, 6 says, knowing this. That our old self, man, that our old man was crucified. That's what we call retroactive positional truth. We were crucified with him. We have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, it's not I who live, but he lives in me. We've been crucified with him. We call that retroactive positional truth. 
We died with him on the cross. He died there for our sins. That's the deal. Knowing this, that the old self man was crucified with him in order that the body of sin, the body of sin might be done away with. That is the, the hold over your life of the master relationship of the sin nature. That thing has been broken in order that the, bo- the body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. See, that's the point. Notice these words, so that, in order that, we would no longer be slaves to the sin nature. Before you were saved, you were absolutely slaves. That's that whole Romans passage understanding. Here's one in Romans 6, 12 through 14. Therefore, do not let sin, sin nature, reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Now he's talking to Christians. Therefore, since since that has been broken, that bondage has been broken, and you're no longer a slave there, you've been delivered from Egypt, so to speak. Therefore, do not let sin reign. And look, remember when the Israelites were traveling in the wilderness around and around and around they go? You know what their number one complaint was? The good old life in Egypt. Remember that? They complained all the time about the good old life in Egypt. When they were in Egypt in the good old life, they complained all the time about being in bondage and, and all that. Remember that? Some people never be satisfied, can they? Because listen... They weren't satisfied in Egypt, but they weren't satisfied in Christ either. Now you're in a dilemma, aren't you? I mean, you got you to pick one. They, they picked him when they, when they came out. And so that's really important. Therefore, do not let. Do not let. You know what that is? That's volition. Now, I am free to choose before. Look, look you're missing it. When I was an unbeliever, I didn't, have a cho- I didn't have a choice. I was in Egypt in bondage. You understand what I mean? I didn't have a choice. But then I got free, right? Christ freed me. Galatians 5, 1 and 13. If, if we, in Christ, we are freed. We are freed. <clears throat> See, now I have a choice of what master. I didn't have a choice of masters over here. I have a choice over here, Right? I've been freed and I have a choice. That's what he's talking about. Do not let, that's volitional. Do not let sin, sin nature, reign in your mortal body, in your your body of flesh, in your mortal body. You've got it from birth. The, The dominance is broken at salvation. And now you have a choice which master you're going to serve. Don't, don't serve, don't let your, don't serve the sin nature. And that's what James is talking about, except he, he approaches it a little different. Do not let sin, sin nature reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. That's volition, that's choice. We know it from the words, do not let. Do not let. Then he comes back, notice there's an and, and he says, do not go on presenting. See, here's another choice. Here's another choice. Do not go on presenting the memory of your body to sin. Do not, listen, you have, listen, you have control over your body, what you're going to do with it. You can walk in the spirit or you can walk in the flesh. You can walk by faith or you can walk by sight. These are choice. You you are a freed person. You the desire for Christ, the desire of Christ is that you serve under him in a master slave relation volitionally with freedom. Do not go on, listen, 
That means stop. Do not go on presenting the members of your body. You understand what the members of your body are? They participate in this. But you let parts of your body participate in sin. You don't have to slap somebody. You don't have to fornicate. You understand? These are choices. Do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but rather present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. That's because of the Holy Spirit in you. Look, go over here to Romans a moment. Go to Romans 8. You know, he's in, Paul goes into the subject matter 6, 7, and 8. In 8, 11, and what life is he talking about? He's talking about a superior life than life in the, on earth. You know, everybody's waiting to die to go to heaven. Listen, he heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Remember that song? Heaven came down. Remember that? And glory. I don't remember how it all goes. I just remember that one line. Listen. You should celebrate the life that you're going to have in eternity is the life that was given to you and your salvation is called eternal. You need to embrace this life here. Not wait to die to embrace it. You Listen, you ought to celebrate and embrace eternal life now, you have it now. John 10.10 10 says, he, Jesus called it the abundant life. There's not a need that you have in your life. Quit looking outside your life to fill your needs. Every need that you have, Christ will fulfill. That's what his job is, right? Right? Supply all your needs according to the riches of grace. You keep looking for, for things to meet all of your needs out there when they're already here being met. That's the deceptive plan of the devil to get you to look outside for things that are not fulfilling inside. Listen, your fulfillment comes from inside you to outside. It doesn't come from outside inside. That's, that's vapor. That's emptiness. Let that well inside you flow in and out. Here's, here is 8.11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, and he does, if you believe in the gospel of Christ, he who raised Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the Holy Spirit who indwells you. <laughs> there, listen, there is more life into his little finger than the whole world outside of you. There is more life of God in his little finger in you than outside if you had the whole world. Why wouldn't you choose? And listen, he's willing to give you more than his little finger. He gave you his whole life. He didn't give a finger for you. He gave his life for you. We keep looking on the outside for fulfillment of our life. There's something. Oh, I'll meet this right guy. I'll meet this right girl. I have this right job. I'll have this. I'll have that. I'll have this. I'll have that. Look, the fulfillment of your life is already in you. You need to reorient the way you think. That verse 11 is a powerful idea. Romans 8 chapter verse 11 is a powerful, powerful idea. Therefore, do not, do not let sin reign in your mortal body. Stop that. So that you obey its lust. Don't do that. Do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but rather present yourself to God spiritually alive from the dead 
and the members of your body as instruments of righteousness to God. Why can't you do that? Is it a choice? Listen to me. Is it a choice? They said, do not let and stop doing this. It's volitional. It's a choice. Nothing good is going to come out. Nothing good is going to come out of your pursuit for happiness in the world. The world is an empty can. It's not a V8. It's an empty can. Everything that you need, you've got to fulfill your life. You keep looking outside, and it's all inside. The can is full. The, world, the world's can, where you're going to try to find peace, happiness, joy, contentment, future, is an empty can. It's full of empty promises. It'll never work out. It will never work out. It's an empty can. It has nothing to offer you in time or eternity but misery and what else? Why you keep going to an empty can to try to find fulfillment in your life is beyond me. Your life is already in a state of fulfillment when you got saved, but you keep looking out rather than looking in, and you're finding nothing but an empty can. And when you go to the world to find some way to be happy, you're never happy. You're never happy. It's only in the moment that you're happy. Outside of that moment, if you take that moment away from you, you'd be the most unhappy person in the world because you're looking at all the wrong places for, right, for the right stuff. You're looking at all the wrong places for the right stuff. And you know who's got you running around there like a chicken with a head cut off? is the devil. The only per- person mocking you the way you're living is the devil. Christ hangs on that cross to give you a life more than you could imagine. And you threw him under the bus. You took his salvation and threw his his life for you under the bus. What is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? Why are you doing that? A thousand voices tell you. A thousand voices tell you that you shouldn't do that. At some point, you've got to wake up and live for Christ. Stop living for the devil and stop hanging your hopes on dreams that will never come true. They're already true in your life. They're already there waiting to be fulfilled. God has filled your life up with all kinds of promises and you're not looking for any of them. And the course you're floating on, the course you're driving is going to be muck and misery because your life is going to wind up in a pig pen full of misery like the prodigal son of Luke 15 because he went to the world and the world's an empty can. Now, I love you. I'm telling you I love you. And I speak from a love from my heart for you. And you've got to shape up. You've bought into the world standard. You're a born-again person. You know that you believe that Christ died for your sins, and you've thrown them under the bus for your life. You pull him back out and put him where he belongs. You correct the stuff going on in your life, and you correct it today. So there can be a great tomorrow for you, because you're, you're an empty can being kicked down the road. You're an empty can being kicked down the road. And you're a born-again person that Christ died for. And you need to shape up. What can I tell you? I bring you a message out of the love of God's heart for you today. 
And I don't care how old you are. I don't care what your age is. Stop going to the world. It's an empty can. There is nothing to be gained from the world in your life. I'm getting ready for the... Listen, if you're a young person, you don't want to go to camp this year. Because you know where I'm going. Because I'm going to camp with this message. You've got to come out of the muck and the mire, young people, and you guys take a stand for Jesus Christ. You got saved by him and threw him back under the bus because you think that he puts too many limits on your life. He puts none on you. He brought freedom to your life, not limits. Because sin shall not be a master over you. Sin should never be a master over you. And listen, it is as long as you keep walking in the flesh. In Romans, the seventh chapter, verse 23, Paul wrote, But you know, I see a different law in the members of my body. I see a different law. I see a different law working in the members of my body. This is where I want you to go. I see a different working in my body, in my marriage. I see a different law working in my life, in, at work, in, in my church, in my, in my relationship with other people. Do you see that? I mean, I don't know. Do you not see it? Paul said, I see a change in my life. I see I see a different law capturing my mind and my heart for Christ. Do you see it? Do you see what Paul saw? Do you see a different law at work in your life regarding how your life is lived and what you submit your life to? Is it compatible with Christ? That's what he's asking you because I'm going to tell you, You need to see for yourself. You say, well, I know the Bible says, ah, ah, ah. Paul said, I see a different law at work in my life. I see the the law of the spirit and life. The spirit and life at work in me. I see a life where God is dominant in my life. Where God is moving and, and directing me and guiding me. I see a different law, Paul writes, in the member of my bodies, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin. Where are you? See, Paul Paul had to see what was happening in his life. He had to see these two wars, internal wars. Which one would he choose? Listen, it's a choice. Which one will you choose? He said, I see a war inside me, a war of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin. You know, that's volitional. It's whether or not you can see the war. If you can see the war, choose to live for Christ. Walk in the power of the spirit. Say no to the lust of the flesh. Say no to it. In Romans 7, chapter, verse 25, listen to what Paul says. Listen to what he says at the close of this magnificent message. He says, thanks be to God through Christ, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. There ought to be your prayer every day. There ought to be. You ought to memorize that prayer. Say that thing about 100 times a day. Every time he brings you. Uh, able to overcome on behalf of Jesus Christ the things you couldn't overcome yesterday you can overcome today because I'm determined that the law of the spirit and life is going to be more powerful than this, the law of sin and death it's a choice I'm going to make I'm going to make it as I, I move along the, my, my walk every day of every week of every year listen to what he said again thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord you got to bring them back from under the bus where you threw them to live your own life in your own way. There's no such thing as living your own life your own way. There is no such thing if you've come to the cross for your salvation. There is no such thing. 
You belong to him. And when you die, you're going to be thankful that he didn't give up on you like you gave up on him. Because to be absent from the body, to be present with the Lord, that's going to be such a thankful day. He wants you to have a thankful day every day. Thank you, Jesus, for being the master of my life and helping me make all the correct choices I need to make in my life. What a wonderful prayer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, on the one hand, I myself, with my mind, am serving the law of God. But on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. There it is. And he says, I thank, I thank the Lord Jesus Christ every day that he has set this straight in my mind and my heart. And I have chosen every day I make a choice. Every day. Listen to that choice. On the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God. But on the other hand, with my flesh, the law of sin. There it is. Which law will I serve? I say to you people, there's only one that makes sense. And out of that, when you begin to choose, you're going to see God bring fulfillment to your life. You say, well, Ron, my life is so empty. I just don't have anything going for me. I just, my, my life is a humdrum. I do this on Monday. I do this on Tuesday. This on Monday. I wish my life could be. And you look outside your life and when it's all inside. It's all inside. Start claiming those promises of God and see him bring to your life the things that you can never bring. The world will never give you that right girl. The world will never give you that right guy. The world will never give you that right job. The world will never give you. It never, never, never. It's not part of the program. All of that's part of the program of being part of the kingdom of Christ. I got to quit. Somebody will have to drive me home. I'm going to tell you. I, I know you thought I've been preaching. I've been tough on you. That, listen, it's out of love I say all this. Your life can so dramatically change today. Not tomorrow. Oh, I'll think about it and tomorrow I'll change. Ah, 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 ah. Now, now is the day, now is the time, now make that commitment to the Lord. Whom are you are going to serve? What master are you going to set under? You make that choice today. You make this decisions the rest of this day and tomorrow and the rest of your life based on what God says is good for you. It'll turn out wonderful. Father, we're thankful today for these had the courage to sit and listen. Oh, Father, I've sat where they sat. I've heard this kind of talk before. But I, like Paul, and so many of the leaders, choose this day to whom I serve, me and my house. I'm going to choose today. I'm going to choose today. There's always a day of reckoning. There's always a day when the rubber hits the pavement. May that, today is the day, Father. Today is the day. Today is the day. Today is the day for many in this church. Today is the day. For those who are still not decided whether they want to do that or not, today is the day to make that decision. I pray for that. I pray for that, Father. I pray for that. That they're, they're the joy, the joy of their salvation, the joy of their walk, the joy of God might be abundant in their life. For we've made this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.